Jason, you obviously use analytics and data to identify some of these trends, as well as, I think, increasingly identify the inefficiencies in the agricultural sector as well. Disease obviously being one of them, but I'm wondering how does that play into a big picture of how the level of preparedness that governments have uh, for facing agriculture and food shortfalls or disruptions like swine fever? Yeah, I mean, you know, swine fever is probably the most unprecedented <laughs> type of outbreak that the global ag industry has seen in the last 50 plus years. Um, and one of the things that makes it quite unique is that China, because, you know, it broke out in China, China is the world's largest consumer of pork, the world's largest importer of soybeans. When you think of global food demand, China is the kind of anchor for that. And so the ramifications that it has for global food markets, it's, it, it, you know, these could last for another three to five years. And one of the things that has made, you know, I think it very clear to the world is actually preparedness, meaning when you see an outbreak, how fast can you react? But also, how fast can you predict what the outcomes are going to be so you know what the alternatives are, right? So do you know how fast it can spread? Do you know what the herd size will become, i.e. how many pigs will die? Um, and then what does that actually mean for global demand? I was going to say, how did it get this bad? Well, one of the things that's very complicated about swine fever is that unlike a lot of other disease which tends to be airborne, this is just through contamination, right? So it spreads in, in very methodical ways. But also because a lot of farming, hog farming in China is backyard farming, the very, very small farms, it gets very hard to control disease when you're dealing with homes that have maybe five pigs, ten pigs at a time and it, it, that spread gets much harder to control than you have you know, a facility with 100,000 that you essentially control right away and then you can control the spread. So it's contamination and unlike a lot of other disease which is airborne where you can actually figure out through wind patterns, etc., this is much harder to actually figure out you know, where it goes next because it's just contamination based. Even without shocks like disease, do you think governments, do you think the Chinese government, for example, are well prepared for the escalation of, of demand? Because I know you've been critical of, for example, US government forecasts of demand and supply in, across agri and food. I think the world as a whole, so it's not just government, I would say even businesses are not prepared to the level and the extent they should be. And the reason is, the shocks to our system are increasingly greater. So this is shocks due to things like disease outbreak or shocks due to things like climate. Um, and these are now happening in a world that is also increasingly more interconnected. And so I would say that it's not just government, it's actually businesses themselves are oftentimes very reactive as opposed to predictive and preventative, yeah. right? So I think to me, similar to the conversations we have in health, we need to have them in agriculture. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up climate because, you know, back at, you know, where I'm from in Australia, we're seeing bushfires at an unprecedented level very early in the season, destroying farms and livestock. How does climate change, and I suppose in lots of part, many parts of the world, the kind of paralysis of policy on climate change play into how optimistic or pessimistic you are about the outlook? You know, I think climate change is a reality we need to live with. It just means that we actually need to use data to better be able to prepare ourselves for what the outcomes are. Because if you think of climate change, you know, oftentimes you think of climate in a single direction, but really it's also just climate volatility, right? So it's increased floods, it's droughts, it's, and it happens kind of in the northern hemisphere, in the southern hemisphere, and the modeling of that risk on a real-time basis becomes imperative because you can then start to better manage whether it's inventory in advance if you're government or if you're a business, manage your supply chain risk a lot more efficiently. So to me, data becomes like critical infrastructure to managing climate risk and if we don't do that, then I think we're, we're in a very dangerous place. In the meantime, while we are seeing those natural disasters, tell us about the cost and availability of financing and insurance in the agriculture market. Well, see, the problem with financing and insurance in the agricultural market as a whole is that the financial architecture around agriculture was really set up right after the Great Depression. And it hasn't changed since. So in places like the US, it's just entirely backed by government. 
Uh, in Europe, it's entirely backed by government. Uh, and in most other parts of the world, lending to the agricultural sector is significantly lower than where it needs to be. And financing agricultural risk is really difficult. And data actually becomes an enabler to starting to change the financial architecture. I actually think one of the big things we need to rethink given the current environment, is what does the financial architecture for our food system need to look like for the next 100 years? Talking about being backed by government, <laughs> the Trump administration now giving billions of dollars of aid to U.S. farmers. Of course, we continue to see the U.S.-China trade war. How badly affected has agriculture in the U.S. been? And also, how are, much are they benefiting because of the lack of, of hogs here in China? So. You know, so the, the relationship between the U.S. and China in agriculture is significantly driven by soybeans and soybean demand, which is used to, to feed the hog herd. Now, this year you have two things going on. You have a trade war, and you also have less demand from China simply because there's less demand for feeding hogs. And when you look at the year-on-year -year numbers um, of actual shipments, it's running, you know, quite low in terms of on a relative to the five-year average, you're still five million tons plus this season behind the five-year normal. Um, so it significantly impacted U.S. farmers in terms of income. However, as you've rightfully pointed out, there's also been payments that have been facilitated both due to climate impact, because don't forget there were also floods this year in the U.S., and there are also payments that were facilitated for the trade war. And so farmers net-net are actually, depending on what state you're in, now this, these payments are not equalized and there's a whole set of dynamics around how to calculate them, but farmers in the U.S. net-net this year have, are actually getting, potentially, being kept whole, regardless of what markets are doing. How agile is, is the agricultural and food production industry to be able to respond to shortfalls or to overcapacity? Which it obviously isn't an issue, but what does your data tell you about in terms of how quickly they can be flexible to respond to changing flows of trade and relationships? I think it really depends on what crop you're looking at. Right. Because there are some where you have very high concentration risk, in which case it gets harder to replace. So I'll give you two examples of concentration risk. Hogs. China, you know, China is just over 50% of the world's market. And so when you, could, when you lose 50% of 50%, replacing that is not an overnight act. So there's a lot of questions as to whether pork demand is going to rebound to the levels it was or whether the Chinese consumer is actually going to start eating more poultry. Uh, are alternative proteins right. going to start taking you know, hold in the market? So there's a lot of questions to be asked there. But the market's not going to react very quickly to that. As I said, in something like hog production, it's going to take three to five years to, to play out. Concentration risk, avocados, <laughs> right? So if you look at the U.S., 75% of avocados imported come from a single place, Mexico, a very specific location within Mexico. Replacing that supply chain takes time. Um, so it just depends on the crop in the region. There are others where there's a lot more distributed risk.